This isn't the real Caesar's Palace, is it? What do you mean? Did Caesar live here? Um, no. I don't think so. I went to Vegas last weekend. Pretty crazy. Vegas, baby! Vegas! Gentlemen, welcome to Las Vegas. Why don't you give me half the money you were gonna bet? Then we'll go out back, I'll kick you in the nuts, and we'll call it a day! Some guys just can't handle Vegas. <laughs> Hey there, and welcome to episode number 19 of the Jeff Does Vegas podcast. My name is Jeff, and I'll be your tour guide for this podcast trek to the best city on the planet, fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. Let's get things started with a little bit of housekeeping, shall we? First off, I want to say a huge thank you to John D. Domenico. John was my special guest on the last episode of the show, and if you haven't had a chance to listen to it yet, I would highly recommend you go back and check it out. John is a Las Vegas-based actor and comedian who specializes in character impersonations. And one character in particular has kept him very, very busy as of late and helped him land his first show on the Vegas Strip. If you want to know more, head to jeffdoesvegas.com and check out episode number 18 of the podcast. Secondly, make sure you're following me on social media at Jeff Does Vegas. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram sharing Vegas-related news, as well as tips and tricks to get you all set for your own Vegas vacation. And if you have questions or you want advice on where to stay, where to eat, what to do, or what shows to see, feel free to reach out and ask. I'll answer you directly and on an upcoming episode of the podcast. And third, make sure you head over to jeffdoesvegas.com so you can fill out the audience survey to share your thoughts on the show. I want to make this podcast experience the best I can for you, so I welcome all your feedback, whether it's good or bad. Plus, the website is also where you can get info on the Jeff Does Vegas patron program, where for as little as $1 a month, you can get access to patron-only content, including early access to new episodes, show and interview archives, and stripped-down versions of the podcast. All right, that's it for the housekeeping. On to the show. Before we dive deep into this episode of the podcast, it's time to get you up to speed with the latest from Sin City with Vegas news you can use. Another week means another big residency announcement. This time, it's Sting who's going to be gracing the stage of the soon-to-be-remodeled Coliseum at Caesars Palace. The former police frontman will open his residency a little over a year from now, May 22nd, 2020. Sting will have 16 shows in Las Vegas in May, June, August, and September of next year, and tickets for the run will go on sale coming up on May the 3rd. This announcement comes on the heels of last week's big announcement. Classic Rocker's Journey will be taking over the Coliseum for a run of shows coming up in October of this year. Back in episode 16 of the podcast, we told you about the Eagles bringing a couple of big shows to Las Vegas in September. For the first time ever, the band is going to be performing their classic album, Hotel California, live and in its entirety. That goes down September 27th and 28th at the MGM Grand Garden Arena. While tickets are now on sale, and if you're wanting to go, be prepared for sticker shock. The only remaining seats are going to cost you, get this, $6,500 each, and they have to be purchased by the pair. Now, to be fair, these are being sold as Platinum Experience tickets, which include front row seats to the show, two nights in a suite at the Aria, Park MGM, or Nomad Hotel, as well as airport transfers, dining credits, hospitality lounge access, Saturday brunch, and a bunch of other perks as well. And illusionist Chris Angel, who spent 10 years headlining at the Luxor and recently moved his Mind Freak show over to Planet Hollywood, released a ton of announcements this past week via social media. He announced that his residency at Planet Hollywood is signed on to go until 2024, also that he's going to undergo shoulder surgery in early 2020, and that due to the physical demands of Mind Freak Live, he was going to be cutting all the late shows from his itinerary. What exactly does that mean? Well, it means his schedule is now strictly one 7 p.m. show five nights a week. A total of 32 performances have been called off and canceled. 
Critics of the show are speculating that the move might have more to do with poor ticket sales and low attendance than actual medical issues, but Chris Angel is sticking by his story, having wrote of the show's incredible success in recent Twitter and Instagram posts. And that's Vegas news you can use. On to the show. I'm going to present you with a situation. You and your significant other are walking down the strip. You're enjoying the sights, the sounds, the scenery, just soaking in the atmosphere. When all of a sudden you're approached by a total stranger who says something along the lines of, what a lovely couple. How'd you like some free show tickets? Now, the first timers and newbies who are listening to this podcast might be thinking, hmm, I'm intrigued. I'd love free tickets to a show. The Vegas veterans, on the other hand, are thinking one thing and one thing only. Run. Run far, run fast, don't engage, don't make eye contact, fake that you don't speak English, fake a heart attack, do whatever it is you have to do in order to get away from this person. The first rule of Vegas is nothing in Vegas is free. Everything has a price. In this case, the price for getting those free show tickets is sitting through a timeshare presentation. For those unfamiliar with the timeshare concept, it's pretty simple. Basically, you're buying the rights to use a unit or suite at a vacation property, either a resort or a condominium complex, for a set period of time, usually one week each year. The sales tactics are often high pressure and somewhat shady. The cost can be high. The fees can be excessive. The terms of the contract extremely restrictive and nearly impossible to get out of. Yet, in spite of all of this, Timeshares are doing a booming business in Las Vegas. To help us navigate the world of timeshares, I enlisted the help of an expert for this episode. I'd like to welcome Lisa Ann Schreier to the podcast. Lisa's been involved in the timeshare community for over 20 years, having gotten her start as a timeshare salesperson and a manager at a number of different resorts in and around the Orlando, Florida area. She's the author of Surviving a Timeshare Presentation, Confessions from the Sales Table, and Timeshare Vacations for Dummies. She's a consumer advocate. She's on the advisory board of ConsumerAffairs.com. She's the lead timeshare advocate at Elliot.org, and she's a featured blogger on RockstarFinance.com. Lisa also runs her own blog, The Timeshare Crusader, where she covers timeshare news and issues, alerting the public to the myriad of less than reputable companies and practices. Something to note here, Lisa is not a lawyer or a legal expert, so although she provides some great insight and answers in our conversation, if you find yourself in a dodgy timeshare situation, you'd be best to consult your own legal counsel. Now, sit back, relax, and enjoy my chat with Lisa Ann Schreier. I'm excited to to talk to you and and do this topic because I think this is a um, I mean it, you know you can't you can't swing a, a dead cat in Vegas without hitting a, a timeshare person on the strip and and um, you know it's it's one of those things where every time I'm walking down the strip and I see somebody walking along and I, I see that person go, hey, you want free tickets and to, to a show? And somebody walks off the path towards them. And in my head, I'm just like, oh, my God, don't don't do it. Don't do it. Stop. Yeah, I know. Stop. I want to grab them and shake them and go, no, don't do it. So so I think that this is a, a, a good topic to um, to cover. Um, so first of all, I, I just want to say thank you very much for, for taking the time to, uh, to chat with me. I really, really do appreciate it. Oh, no, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. And, and so, uh, I, you reached out to me, I put a post out on Twitter saying, Hey, I want to do an episode about timeshares. And you reached out to me almost instantly and said, Hey, I would love to be a part of this and doing a little bit of research and a little bit of Google into you, my dear. You have quite the little, <laughs> quite the little history um, with timeshares. You were a timeshare salesperson at one point, correct? Correct. That's how I got my start in the business. Yes. And and so were you? You were a, a salesperson, or were you one of the people trying to bring people in? What what was your position exactly? No, I was a salesperson. I was not what they call an OPC, which is the ones up and down the strip in Vegas trying to get you in. I was actually a salesperson. And then for a short time, a sales manager. So I actually sold timeshares for 
um, on and off for about five years, from about 2000 to 2005. And so when you were doing this, I mean, I've I've only honestly I've never gone into one of the a timeshare presentation anywhere on any trip that I've been in whether it's I mean I've been to Florida I've I've run the gauntlet at the airport in Puerto Vallarta in Mexico you know I've I've walked up and down the strip in in Vegas and and I've managed to avoid going to any of the timeshare presentations so just out of my own you know I've only heard like I say I've only heard the horror stories from people was it a very super high pressure sales environment? Um, it, it can be. Um, I would say when I was selling me personally, I was never a high pressure salesperson because I don't believe in high pressure sales. And if it were me on the other end, I, I don't do well under high pressure sales. Um, I would say on average, Yes, it is a high pressure sale because you're there for two, three, maybe four hours. The salesperson has that amount of time to convince you, to persuade you, to hand over X amount of dollars plus, you know, uh, payments for seven to 10 years for a deed in perpetuity for an average selling price now of just around $22,000. So it is high pressure because in the world of timeshare sales, it's always today. There is no tomorrow. Um, they're called be backs. Nobody comes back. There, there's no such thing as a I'll be back. Mm -hmm. And that's because the industry frowns on that. They don't let you come back. It's today or never. So some of the common tactics that salespeople will use then to try to um, convince a person, I mean, obviously convince may not be the, the right word, but I mean, I guess that that's what they're trying to do is they are trying to convince you that you need to buy into this. What are some of the, the common tactics other than the, hey, there is no tomorrow. This is a one time only deal. What are some of the other common tactics that the, the timeshare salespeople will use? Um, when, um, when I was selling, we used fear of loss and hope of gain. So what are you going to lose if you don't buy this? And of course, what do you have to gain by do buying this? So commonly we compared, you know, the, the look, the feel, the amenities of the resort that they were trying to sell you versus whatever hotel you're currently staying in. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of timeshare resorts let non-owners stay on property, which kind of defeats that sales tactic altogether. Right. So the whole thing is about uncovering a vacation problem, because without a problem, there is no solution. The solution is, of course, the timeshare. So it's uncovering one or more vacation problems and convincing, persuading the client that this is the best solution for said vacation problem. And again, it's a today only thing that this deal will not be offered to you tomorrow. This has to be done today. Um, why not today? What makes today different than tomorrow? So the whole thing is based upon uncovering a vacation problem, showing them a solution, which inevitably is the timeshare. And then, you know, the whole thing is today, whether it's offering them a special discount, which, of course, may or may not exist because there is no such thing as a base price. Most people don't go in knowing the average sales price of a timeshare. So you talk about it, you know, they, they use this tactic of, of giving a solution to a problem. Is it? In my mind, I feel like it's a, a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. It could very well be. And that's that's that you're right. That's the problem. So a salesperson's job, in addition to selling, is either uncovering a problem or coming up with a problem that the client didn't even know existed. <laughs> because, like I said, unless there's a problem, there's no need to buy the timeshare. Why would you buy the timeshare unless there's a problem you're trying to solve. 
And I mean, I, I look at that and I mean, you threw out a number of, of you know, twenty five thousand dollars and I've seen them, you know, higher and higher, you know, thirty, thirty five, forty thousand dollars, which in my mind is a mind blowing number. And and I mean, I look, you know, I'm looking at this from the Las Vegas perspective because that's, you know, the world that I, I kind of live in. And and I mean, I look at the the cost of a hotel and I look at how often I go because, I mean, I do five or seven trips a year down there. So, you know, with a timeshare, generally you're buying one week a year, correct? Typically, yes. Now, if you buy into a timeshare that operates on the point system, you may be, you may be able to get several shorter stays out of it. But in general, yes, a week. So I look, I mean, at what I spend on a, a week's worth of, you know, on, on a year's worth of Vegas vacations for me, it's probably nowhere close to that amount of money. And I mean, that that timeshare, that's just my place to stay. I still have to get there. I still have to eat. I still have to do stuff, right? Like, I mean, that's sure. th that to me, that's just a crazy amount of money. It is. And um, again, it's that twenty five or twenty two thousand dollar average sale price um, in theory gets you a lifetime of vacations. Plus, it is generally willable, meaning it goes on forever. It's a contract in perpetuity. But again, um, that does not include maintenance fees, which typically go up every year. It doesn't include usage fees. It doesn't include reservation fees. So what I find um, vastly different in 2019 than let's say back in 2000, when I started selling in 2000, is that the value proposition is getting harder and harder to find. So I'm just going to dial back for just a second. So the maintenance fees, that was something that I always knew about. Um, and that's that's an annual fee that you pay, correct? Correct. And so how much on average, and I mean, again, we're just kind of generalizing here. Um, on average, what would be a, a, what would somebody pay every year for this so-called maintenance fee? I believe in 2018, the average maintenance fee for a timeshare in the U.S. hovered right around $900. So you're paying $900 a year on top of the $25,000 that you've paid to purchase this. And then you mentioned usage fees and reservation fees as well. Correct. Every time you use your timeshare, there's a fee involved. So whether, let, let's say you own in Vegas and you want to use it um, the following year in San Francisco, you need to belong to an exchange company, which there's an annual fee for membership to that. And then there's a fee to exchange it. So there's an exchange fee, a membership fee, even sometimes if you come back to your home resort, many times there's a reservation fee to come back to your home resort. So it's not just the purchase price that people need to look at. It's all the additional fees after that. So you've purchased your week. And, and as I say, I mean, with some of these ones that I've looked at, I know like I've been online and I've looked at the, the different timeshare sales websites that are out there that, you know, where people are trying to unload these things. And they'll say, you know, it's week 48 or week, you know, 52 or whatever. So even though you're guaranteed that one week every year that you're always going to have in perpetuity, that's a big word for me, um, <laughs> you're still going to pay, they're still going to ding you a reservation fee. Yep. Um, I think the only time you don't pay to come back to your home resort is if you own fixed week, fixed unit, and it's nearly impossible to find a resort anymore that is selling fixed week, fixed unit. Um, most sell a floating week, which is a week within a specific uh, season, let's say, or as I said earlier, more and more resorts are selling point-based products. And in many cases, you don't even own any real estate. Um, you simply get a certain allotment of points every year and you can use those points for, you know, shorter stays than one week, larger units than you may own. So for instance, a week in a two bedroom is gonna require 
more points than a week in a one bedroom. So it's a little bit more flexible, but again, you got to factor in all those fees. Wow. I mean, it just, it's, it blows my mind that it starts adding up like that. Like, I guess, you know, in my head, and again, as a person who's never gone through a presentation or never sat down and really, really looked at it, I just always kind of assumed, okay, you know, yeah, you're laying out this large sum of money up front or, you know, financing it for the rest of your natural life and your kids' natural lives and their kids' natural lives. And and then that's it. You know, you pay that, you pay your, your annual maintenance fee and so be it, that's it. I had no idea that they dinged you with all these extra fees on top of that. That's just absolutely crazy. Yeah, and most people don't understand that when they go in. Um, you know, so the fees are always a surprise and um, people aren't asking the right questions. You know, so people might understand that, yes, there's a maintenance fee, but very few people are asking the important question, which is, how much is the, how much of the maintenance fees gone up in the last five years? And what is the legal limit? How much can you raise these fees? People just don't ask. And the salesperson, of course, that's not something they're going to volunteer. Right. They're not they're not going to volunteer information that might cost them a sale. Correct. So I guess that leads into into my next question quite nicely. Actually, we want to make sure people, if they're going into these things, are are well well prepared and well armed with the right information as a a, a a timeshare consumer advocate what questions would you recommend that people should be asking in addition to that question about the 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 maintenance fees and and how much they've gone up and such well in addition to the fees you want to make sure you have a clear understanding and ask the difference in case you don't understand is this a fixed week is it a floating week? Is it a point system? You need to understand the differences between those three types of ownership. Um, you want to understand um, also, are there any special assessments? Has the resort um, assessed anything over the last five years? You want to understand how the reservation system works. And you also want to understand how the trading or the exchange works. So many times your salespeople will um, tell you, you know, lure you in a wonderful promises of, wouldn't you like to own here, buy here, that you could go to Hawaii every year? Well, in theory, this sounds really good, but unless you fully understand how the exchange system works, you're not gonna go to be able to go to Hawaii Christmas week with you know a two week notice it doesn't work like that so again it's it's on the consumer to ask the right questions because what the consumer doesn't understand is that the person asking the questions is in fact in charge of the presentation and most consumers think automatically that the salesperson is in charge well the salesperson is only in charge because he or she's asking the questions. Once the consumer starts asking questions, they're in control. So it's important to understand the person asking the questions, they're the one in control. That's an excellent point. I, I you know, and it makes, makes absolute complete sense to me because I mean, they've got you there. It's their job to, to sell it to you. You really sitting there as the, the timeshare customer, the person in the presentation, you've got nothing to lose. It's it's up to the person on the other side of the table, like I say, to, to really sell it to you. Absolutely. And and keep in mind, again, you know, somewhere along the line, when you agree to go to this presentation, somewhere in writing that you signed off on, it says the minimum amount of time, or I, yeah, the minimum amount of time you have to be there. That, I mean, that's it. If it says 120 minute presentation, you are under no obligation to stay there three, four, five hours. And increasingly, I hear stories, especially from older people who, you know, come crying to me and, oh, I sat through it, they kept me there for seven hours. No, you allowed yourself to stay there for seven hours. Nobody had a gun to your head. Nobody, you know, 
for anyone to sit through a timeshare presentation for seven hours, I don't condone those practices, but again, the consumer has got to take some responsibility. Mm -hmm. After two hours, if you've given up two hours of your time and that's what you're supposed to do and you don't want it, get up and leave. No gift, whatever they're going to offer you, is worth seven hours of your time. It's just, it's silly. I don't understand why people allow themselves to, to subject themselves to that. And, and you know what? I, I totally agree with you on that because I've heard those stories. And again, I've heard the stories and the horror stories from people that have been, you know, dragged in off the strip. And I've, I've even been going through some of the hotels in Vegas that have timeshares in them or around them and where they're doing the presentations and you see the people getting walked away. And I just think, Oh my God, the tickets to the fantastic cat show magic extravaganza are just not worth your time like even even two hours of my vacation to give up so that i can go and and sit and try and be pressured into purchasing a a timeshare just to me doesn't seem seem worth it um and, and again and and like you say so people just they've got that legal right to just get up and leave after x amount of time absolutely absolutely so one thing that i always tell people to keep in mind is do not ever hand over your driver's license and or credit card because that's a ploy that more and more resorts are employing. They'll hold your credit card and or driver's license basically hostage to keep you there. Well, again, a smart consumer, I'm not handing over my driver's license and credit card to anybody. Why would you do this? Why would you let some stranger hold on to your credit card or driver's license while you're in a sales presentation? That's just, it. you know, again, do I condone those practices? Absolutely not. Does the consumer need to take some responsibility? Absolutely. From what it sounds like you're saying, it's, it's using a little bit of common sense when you go into these things. Absolutely. And common sense, for some reason... Um, you know, I've been writing about timeshares for nearly 20 years now, and for some reason, common sense seems to go out the window when you start talking about timeshare, because what I always tell people is if you take away the word timeshare and replace it with the word automobile, you'd never do these things. You would never do these things. You would never buy a car after doing no research at all into average selling price, or comparing a a Chevy to a Ford, you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't do it after listening to the salesperson rattle on for two, three, four hours. You would never sign the dotted line without reading all the terms and conditions. But people seem to do this all the time with timeshares. It's like, you know, it and and understand, of course, the industry takes full advantage of that. The industry knows that most people I don't like to use the word all, but let's say 99% of people who are at a timeshare presentation are on vacation. They're in the ether. They're trying to have fun. Their common sense many times flies out the window. Um, you know, I can tell you from many years working part-time at Disney World, at Walt Disney World here in Orlando, you know, people's common sense on vacation sometimes eludes them. So the industry is full aware of that. They take full advantage of that. So that being said, then, is there, you know, much like other industries and other sales professions, is there an industry watchdog for timeshares? Like, is there if somebody has a, a negative timeshare experience, is there a, a, some kind of governing body or government regulated group that you can file a complaint with? Or are you kind of just stuck in on your own? You're pretty much stuck on your own. I mean, you can, of course, um, depending on the egregiousness of the complaint, there's um, there's the real estate division in each individual state. There's the, each state's attorney general. There's the FTC. If it gets really involved, there's the FBI. But there's no governing body for consumers to go to. It's kind of a hit and miss by state. Um, which is unfortunate because, for instance, as far as a cancellation or a rescission period, 
each state has a different amount of time that the, that the consumer is allowed to cancel and get their money back. So there's not really a, um, oversee, an oversight department for everybody. It's very hit or miss. I always tell people if they're going to file complaints, file with um, as many as possible, including AG's offices, including the real estate division. Um, you can file with um, ARTA. ARTA is the governing body, the kind of the trade association for timeshares themselves. They do have a resort owners coalition, but the problem is they don't get involved in individual cases whatsoever. And I would imagine, too, it sounds like they're kind of a, uh, I, I'm assuming they're a self-regulated kind of group of people. So they're absolutely, I would think they're kind of just watching out for their own, right? Absolutely. Wow. Just amazing. I had a friend that used to tell me when it came to going back to the common sense point, he used to say, you know, they should call it uncommon sense because so few people actually seem to have it. <laughs> oh, it's very true. I, I just, I, I, you know, I hear from consumers on a daily basis and most of them, unfortunately, are, oh, my God, what did I do? Or I bought this and now I want out. What do I do? And I, sometimes you just have to shake your head and go, really? I, I mean, like I said, I don't condone um, salespeople taking advantage of consumers. I don't condone the lying. I don't condone the hurry up. You have to buy it today. But again, where's the consumer's common sense in all of this? Do you have any other kind of buyer beware tips with with that you can share with people for for timeshares and purchasing timeshares? If people are, you know, you've gone through the whole thing, you want to do this. What what are some other buyer beware tips that you can share? Well, you want to make sure that if you've gone through a presentation, you know, I advise people do not buy it, especially if it's the first timeshare you've ever sat through the first timeshare presentation. Check to see if the same product is available on the secondary market. Um, usually there's a there's a glut of timeshare on the secondary market. Most of it is available for a tiny fraction of what the resort is charging you. Um, again, you have to do your research. You have to understand that there are certain usage restrictions that if you're gonna buy it on the secondary market, you don't get what we call the full bundle of rights. You can't do everything with it that you can when you buy it from the developer. But most people, that's for most people, that's not a big, that's not a big turnoff. So again, don't buy it in haste. Um, check the resale market to see what's available. And to your point, you know, do you really want to spend two hours? Because it's never two hours, it always turns into three or four hours of your vacation time listening to something you may not even be interested in doing. So go in and arm yourself with the questions you need to ask. Now, I, I have a list of 19 questions consumers need to ask before they even go into a timeshare presentation. And rather than charging people hundreds and hundreds of dollars for this, I'm making it available for $2.99, which is the best $2.99 you'll ever spend. Because again, I look at it from both the standpoint of an ex-timeshare salesperson, as well as someone who's looked at this industry for 20 years now. And there are at least 19 questions, but I've identified 19 questions that you need to ask before you do anything. And most of them, people don't even think of. Like you were saying earlier, you understand there's a maintenance fee, but that's step one. Step two is how much has the maintenance fee gone up over the last five years? Step three, how much can the resort raise the maintenance fee? And until you know all that stuff, you're not in any position to make a purchasing decision for an average price of $20,000 for again, a contract in perpetuity. And I've heard horror stories about those maintenance fees too. I mean, I've heard stories where uh, a property will change ownership or change change hands and or a resort will change ownership or change hands. And the next thing you know, the new owners are are jacking that maintenance fee, you know, a ridiculous amount. 
and and surprise, you don't have a choice because boom, there it is. You're an owner and suck it up, buttercup. There you go. This is what you signed on for. Correct. Absolutely. And if you don't ask, you know, and, and again, the salesperson might not know the answer, but that doesn't mean you stop asking the question. You need to know what is the maximum amount they can raise this maintenance fee every year and feel free that if they say, you know, they can raise it up to 30 percent a year. I'm sorry. I did that. That's, that doesn't seem really consumer friendly. Would I agree to that? Absolutely not. But again, people don't ask that question. People just go, oh, well, here's the maintenance fee and not think about it again. And as I said earlier, not to sound like a broken record, but the industry is fully aware that people are looking at these things while they're on vacation. Nobody really wants to be there. So the consumer themselves is trying to get out in a hurry. And the industry understands this. So they try to sneak in as much as possible. I'm not, I'm not saying that every single timeshare is a bad deal. Um, for instance, I had lunch three weeks ago with someone that bought a timeshare from me 19 years ago. They love it. They think it's the best thing they've ever bought. But again, you know, it, it there's, there's no one size fits all. So there are some people that benefit from a timeshare, but it's the educated consumer that benefits from the timeshare. And I think you really, you did nail it because I do know people, I mean, a, a couple of years ago, my wife and I were down in Mexico and the resort that we went to was an all inclusive that also, I mean, as they all do, had timeshare units. And we were sitting by the pool with a couple that has been going to that same resort for the last 15 years. They go the same week, every week, every year. They they know all the staff. They know, you know, all of that. In my mind, that's just really boring. But I guess, I mean, for them, that works. Exactly. It, exactly. I couldn't go to the same place every year. So I, I mean, I, I'd go crazy. But again, different people like different things on vacation. And again, when you're talking about the, the cost, the cost of the timeshare versus the cost of the hotel, if you're the type of person that is happy, pleased, whatever, with an, a typical hotel room of, let's say, $100 a night, the timeshare might not be for you because it might, A, it's more expensive, and B, it might be, you know, too much. So again, when the timeshare salesperson starts making their cost comparisons, which they inevitably do, make sure those cost comparisons are realistic for you. Um, and the problem in today's market, unlike back in 2000 when I was selling timeshare, is the consumer has a whole bunch more um, alternatives now than they did back then. I mean, back then it was timeshares or hotels. That was pretty much it. There was no Airbnb. There wasn't also the just the sheer amount of options people have. And a timeshare may not be the cheapest alternative. Um, that's one of the problems I have with the way the industry positions itself. They're constantly trying to say you save so much money by buying a timeshare. Well, a, I don't believe it. And B, in my mind, that's not really a good marketing message because I look at a company like Apple. Apple does not position itself as the cheapest product out there because A, they're not the cheapest product out there. And B, there's a certain cachet with not owning the cheapest product out there. So that's one of my biggest complaints with the industry is that they keep trying to push this as a cost saving uh, vacation accommodation. And for the vast majority of people, it isn't. You're going to spend more money on a timeshare than you would in an average hotel room. That's just a fact of life. Like you said, even if you just look at the purchase price, $20,000 plus a $900 maintenance fee every year can get you a whole lot of hotel. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I in my head, I'm going through, 
you know, what I've paid when I've stayed at, at Vegas hotels. And I mean, even, you know, Vegas has its own issues with resort fees and things like that. But even if you hit up, you know, you, you take it up to uh, the cost with the resort fee where, you know, you get up to, you know, you're, you're paying $90 or $100 a night. That's, you know, $20,000. I'm no math a magician, but that's a hell of a lot of hotel nights. Absolutely. <laughs> You mentioned the the secondary market, and and I had mentioned earlier that I've you know kind of perused some of those websites where people are trying to unload their their timeshares, and I mean I've seen them for as little as a dollar on there. When you see a timeshare for a dollar, is that just somebody that's trying to? They're just done. They've had it. They're just trying to offload it, or or is there something wrong with that? Uh, could be either one. Could be somebody just trying to offload it. They're done with it. But again, um, I being a suspicious person by nature, I always try to find out why. So, for instance, one of the questions you need to ask when you're buying a timeshare in the secondary market is you need to make sure that the maintenance fees are up to date. Um, I cannot tell you how many times I've heard from people who bought a timeshare thinking, oh, it's a great deal, and then found out the maintenance fees are in arrears by 10 years. Oh, my Not God. Not such a great deal. Yeah. Wow. So you're, you are, I'm, I'm learning so much today. This is just amazing. Um, so I guess the, the next question then is, you've sat through the, the presentation, you've been there for three hours, they've, they've hammered you down, they've convinced you, they've sold you on it. And and down the road, you think, oh, my God, this was silly. I want out of this. What are my options? Uh, much depends on is the timeshare paid in full or not. Let's talk about if the timeshare is paid in full, you may be able to sell it. But again, the resale value of a timeshare is in most cases a small fraction of what you paid the developer. Um, you can list it for sale yourself. Um, some resorts, some developers do put restrictions on how you can advertise this timeshare for sale. Again, it's one of the questions you need to ask before you even buy it. What are my rights? What are my restrictions? What are my responsibilities? Um, all the way through. So again, you can sell it. Um, you may want to rent it and recoup at least the maintenance fees every year. If the timeshare is not paid in full, um, your chances of selling are slim and none. Um, because like you said, most people, if you look through the secondary market, there's enough timeshares being sold for a dollar, for a hundred dollars, for a thousand dollars. No one is gonna buy your timeshare that you still owe $5,000 on. Um, so in that case, you are um, mostly out of luck. Um, that's the number one email and the number one call I get from consumers is, oh my God, I want out, what do I do? I can tell you what you don't want to do. You do not want to pay anybody up front who says they're going to sell your timeshare for you or worse, I will get you out of your timeshare. Um, it is now... Um, a huge problem um, is that there are more and more companies springing up every day that claim to be able to get consumers out of timeshare for five, six, seven, I've heard up to $10,000. Um, do not do business with these people. Anybody who takes the money up front and claims they're going to be able to do it, big red flag. Um, you don't want to do business with anybody who initiates contact. And many of these companies just buy mailing lists and just start call, call calling people. And again, that's where I tell people, take the word timeshare out, replace it with the word automobile. If somebody called you up out of the blue and said, hey, aren't you tired of making, you know, front wheel alignments and, and oil changes on your 2010 Corolla, you know, if you pay me, I'll get you out of it. You'd go, what are you talking about? And hang up on them. <laughs> Unfortunately, with timeshares, people willingly hand over three, four, five, six thousand dollars to these people 
who claim to be able to get you out of your timeshare. Again, a timeshare contract in most cases in the US is a carefully constructed contract in perpetuity. The industry has had 40 years to perfect these contracts. They are not easy to get out of. Um, there are some tactics you can use. Again, it's a matter of what to say to whom. Um, and each case is different. So I tell people, I do not guarantee results, at least positive results. I mean, there's always results. Hmm. But anybody who guarantees you that they're going to be able to get you out of your timeshare is lying. So I'm really I'm glad you brought those companies up because, again, when you if you jump on Google and you enter timeshare exit, there's a thousand different companies that that pop up. So people are are best to stay. I mean, your your advice as a consumer advocate is stay away from those companies. Yes, um, because, again, um, they make it sound much easier than it actually is. Um, you know, what are you actually getting? for your $6,000. And again, we have to look at the cost comparison. Um, if your timeshare is paid in full and you're gonna pay someone $6,000 to get, get it away from you, why? You know, sell it for a dollar, sell it for no money, just sell it to get out of it. Now, if you owe $20,000 on your timeshare, you may wanna look at hiring a competent timeshare seasoned attorney. But again, be careful who you're hiring. Um, many of these things, many of these pop up companies say they're attorneys, but again, do your due diligence. The vast majority of them are not staffed by attorneys at all. So again, I do offer consulting on this. I don't get anybody out, but again, it's a matter of what to say to who. And what I do is I tell people, okay, here's who to write to, here's what to say, especially if you think that you were sold the timeshare under less than honest practices, where you lied to when you originally bought it. Do most of these timeshare companies have, um, and again, I'm just asking your your thoughts and from your knowledge and your experience, do they have a, a cooling off period? Like if I go into a presentation and I sit down and I'm on vacation and I sign on for this and I'm like, yeah, this is great and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, the next day I wake up and go, oh, my God, what the hell have I done? Am I able to to get out of that or am I stuck? Yeah, no, every state does have a legally mandated cooling off period, um, ranges anywhere from three to 10 business days in the U.S. Um, so, yes, the, the short answer is yes, there is a cooling off period. The the further question, the further answer is you must follow the instructions to the letter. It's not as simple as you wake up the next morning and you go back to the resort and you go, yeah, I changed my mind and give them everything back. That's not going to suffice. There's carefully written instructions, which again, are not going to be easily, um, you know, the salesperson is not going to show you what the cancellation process is. You as the consumer need to ask before you sign to purchase, if I change my mind, if I want to cancel, what do I need to do? And have them show it to you in writing those rules and regulations, and they vary from developer to developer, have to be followed to the letter. Well, right. I mean, again, as you say, I mean, the, the salesperson's job is to that it's to take your money, not to give it back. Correct. Wow. Um, any other words of wisdom, any other pearls of, of, of wisdom from your experience that you want to share with people? I mean, this has been fascinating to me and, and has really, uh, really opened my eyes on this. Is there, is there anything else that you want to share with people? Um, just like I said, you want to make sure you're, if you're going to sign up for a timeshare presentation, you want to understand your rights and responsibilities, and you want to understand that the salesperson, as nice as they might be, the salesperson's job is to sell you a timeshare. They're not your friend. 
they're not anything else. And sadly, I see too many old people falling prey to this. They think the salesperson's there to be their friend. Like you said earlier, the salesperson's job is to sell you a timeshare. So remember to keep your wits about you, understand your rights and responsibilities, and a good deal today will be a good deal tomorrow. If you, if you say no at the end of the presentation, and for some reason you wake up the next morning and you go, you know, that was a good deal. If you go back and you offer them that same amount of money, if you, if you seriously think they're not going to take your money, you got some, you got some problems. And if they don't, then walk. Because a good deal today is going to be a good deal tomorrow and a good deal next week. So long and the short of it, I guess the big question finally, <laughs> and I know I already know the answer to this one, is a timeshare a good investment, Lisa? A timeshare should never be used as an investment, um, even if you're buying uh, a timeshare that does have a real estate component. This is not an investment. It's simply a way and if you're looking at the dollars and cents of it, it's a way of reallocating money that you would spend on vacation accommodations anyway. I always looked at it when I was selling timeshare. I referred to it as the anyway money, the money you'd be spending anyway. Lisa, I, I so appreciate you taking the time to to come on the podcast and 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 chat about this it's been incredibly educational for for me and and for my listeners i hope and uh if people want to get in contact with you how can they go about doing that sure my email is lisa schreier that's s-c-h-r-e-i-e-r 617 at gmail.com or if you just google the timeshare crusader you can pretty much find me. And of course, you're on Twitter as well. You're on social media. I am. Twitter is Lisa Looks At. And my blog is the Timeshare Crusader dot blogspot dot com. Lisa, thank you so much for taking the time to chat today. I really do appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thanks so much. <laughs> That pretty much wraps things up for this episode of the show. As always, if you've got feedback or comments about the episode, or you've got Vegas-related questions, you are absolutely welcome to reach out via social media on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at Jeff Does Vegas, or email me directly, jeff at walkernewmedia.com. Speaking of which, I want to thank Martin, a.k.a. Marty's Ma, on Twitter, who sent me a message this week asking for suggestions for bars to check out on his upcoming Vegas trip. He's coming to Vegas from the UK with a few of his mates to celebrate his 40th birthday this summer. I suggested he and his pals check out the Chandelier Bar at the Cosmo, Center Bar at the Mirage, Nine Fine Irishmen at New York, New York, and, just for fun, Coyote Ugly, also at New York, New York. Again, if you're planning a Vegas trip and you need ideas on where to stay, where to eat, what to do, or shows to see, get in touch with me and I'll answer you in an upcoming episode of the podcast. Before I let you run, I do have a few quick plugs I want to toss out. If you find yourself in Vegas on a Friday night and you're looking for a great evening of entertainment, head out to the Piazza Lounge in the Tuscany Suites and Casino and check out my very good friend Kenny Davidson as he hosts Kenny Davidson's Celebrity Piano Bar. Kenny and his band are accompanied by different Vegas performers every week, and you never know who's going to show up. It happens every Friday night starting at 845. Another one of my very good Vegas friends, Lisa Marie Smith, is back home in Las Vegas and taking her new music project, LMS, all around town, performing everywhere. If you want to keep up to date on LMS, follow Lisa on Twitter and Instagram at SingLisaMarie. And if you want a sample of her amazing vocal talent, her self-titled debut EP is streaming on Spotify and Apple Music and is available for download on iTunes. The links are available in the show notes at jeffdoesvegas.com. And I'm happy to announce I'm going to be talking with Lisa in an upcoming episode of the podcast. And I make no secret on this show about my love for The Space, an awesome off-strip venue over at Polaris and Harmon where they've got some amazing shows coming up, including 
Travis Clower, star of the Tony Award and Grammy Award winning Broadway show Jersey Boys, is coming back to the space on May the 10th. The girl of a thousand voices, Christina Bianco, brings her show, me, myself, and everyone else to the space for two shows on June 8th and 9th. And if you're going to be in Vegas anytime in October, make plans to be at the space for Evil Dead the Musical HD. That runs from October 2nd to the 27th. Tickets and info for all these shows and more available online at thespacelv.com. And don't forget about Monday's Dark at the Space. Twice a month, host Mark Chinook is joined by his Vegas friends for a night of music and more as they raise 10K in 90 minutes for a local Las Vegas charity. Tickets start at just $20 and are available online along with charity info and show dates at mondaysdark.com. As for me, my next trip to Las Vegas isn't on the schedule until mid-June, meaning I'm going to be going through some very serious Las Vegas withdrawal. I'll be living vicariously through all of your Vegas trips, so please feel free to share your photos with me and my listeners, as well as your own personal Vegas suggestions for where to stay, where to eat, what to do, and what to see. Again, reach out via social media at Jeff Does Vegas. Again, thank you so much for listening to the show. Be sure to subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Podbean, or anywhere else, so you'll know the instant new episodes are uploaded. And don't forget to check out jeffdoesvegas.com for show archives and info on the Jeff Does Vegas patron program. My name is Jeff, and this has been episode number 19 of the Jeff Does Vegas podcast, a Walker New Media production.